So, uh, you let me know when to start. I'm ready. Okay, I think that. Okay, Rocio, uh, you are doing the managing the session. Uh, and in the meantime, I'll try to understand how to uh, solve the situation. Okay, okay, thank you, Carmelo. So I think that Professor Chamora is ready to start, yes? Yeah. Yes, okay. I'm ready. And I think that all of us are hearing you properly, except mm -hmm. Carmelo, so, so you can start whenever you want. Okay, uh, uh, good afternoon and also good morning to mm -hmm. other, uh, uh, you know, uh, people all over uh, the world. My uh, uh, discussion will be on the example of uh, design uh, specifications, a case of breathing aid devices. And uh, of course, the first thing is to find out what's the problem. Uh, so in the presentation floor, uh, I'll highlight the problem that we have in design and other processes if we uh, begin to work on that. Then the process, the approval procedures, interest from the African Organization for Standardization also, and then we'll have a discussion on the technical specifications for breathing aid uh, devices as an example. So if you allow me to proceed based on this floor, uh, the major problem that I have uh, seen and noticed is that most of the designs from conception to delivery are mostly done without standards or without looking at standards, but also without specifications. When you look at an end product being exhibited or offered for use, commerce, you find that there's no nameplate value or specs highlighting what that product performance is all about, which standards is following and related matter. So that's the problem. And uh, in medical uh, equipment, lack of standards and specifications is a recipe for disaster, particularly uh, that it could cause a loss of life. So that's number one. And I've seen that this is a problem in many countries and in Malawi, as a case in point, uh, we proposed a solution that we develop specifications for such matter that is, does not have specifications. For so in this case, uh, uh, medical equipment related to response to COVID-19. And to do that, we need to have a nexus, an ecosystem of users. This includes patients and medical specialists, engineers, policy holders, and using the appropriate channels. And I, for one, myself from the University of Malawi, uh, successfully led the process of developing, reviewing, submission for acceptance of the Ministry of Health and Malawi government, uh, the design specifications. And then that's why I'm, I'm, I'm here to share with you the experiences, the way, the, 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 the way how to do it, and the results. So you see that if you and I are considering a design of a breathing earth machine, look at the mouthpiece, uh, whether invasive or non-invasive. Invasive means being put or plugged around the human body or face and non-invasive, but invasive uh, having pipes coming through the road, the throat, the nostrils, the mouth, whichever way you need to know the sizes, the standards, the specifications. For example, how much diameter of a pipe can get into one's nostril being a baby paid or an adult, a person in critical care, or other. So those are the kind of things that we are particularly concerned with uh, in this case. Now, uh, in, in regarding to uh, breathing aid uh, devices, for example, the ventilators and the CPAP machines, which we'll actually get into the more details later, uh, uh, World Health Organization developed the technical specifications as minimum guidelines for both invasive and non-invasive. And uh, so this uh, we have actually digested, looked into, customized, and included the other you know, engineering specifications to be able to come up with comprehensive list of uh, specs or specifications for breathing aid devices, which uh, you know, have attracted interest uh, globally. Uh, I would like to challenge each one of us here that I think in design, uh, engineering design, 
would have several steps, maybe one to seven. I think this we can look at it later when you download the uh, PowerPoint, you can zoom in and to see. But step number one highlights that whosoever is doing design from, con from concept to delivery, you need to consider user needs and regulatory requirements. This is where now you need to consider what are the standards to be considered. If they are not there, what else can we do? And what are the specifications that we have to consider? If they're not there, you need to develop those the one. The user needs for specifications, whether it's in computer science, electronics, telecommunications, whatsoever field, biomedical, wireless engineering, you need to consider the user needs and regulatory requirements. That's why we are promoting the idea that we have here. <clears throat> Just for example, one of the breathing air devices that is, is of our interest <clears throat> is a, a CPAP machine that we see uh, you know, held in, the, in both hands in there, the blue uh, metal box. <clears throat> it has one uh, pipe and maybe two or three you know, other pipes. One should be for oxygen, the other one is just for air and several other aspects. To come up with a, <clears throat> a device of that sort, the CPAP. CPAP means continuous positive air pressure. I will discuss, discuss that later in detail. Um, there should be some specifications uh, regarding pressure, elements, volumes to be considered, you know, powering of that device, if at all it has some electrical circuits or electronic circuits inside. So that is important. This CPAP was developed and is on open source by University of California, Los Angeles, uh, UCLA, <coughs> Ventura, I should say UCLA Ventura. And uh, we have uh, accessed the files and we're able to reverse engineer or recraft this one using 3D printing, but also a CNC machines uh, for raving, but also milling. If we now ask the question, what is the purpose and the process of uh, specifications, much more so the ones we have developed uh, for breathing aid. My answer is uh, simple, uh, that the process has been highly co uh, consultative. The text can be skipped, but I can highlight to you that in the text, what we have done is to consider who will use uh, the breathing aid machines. So we have to consider the patient. So a patient is one of the partic participants in the uh, design specifications, formulation, or development. And then there must be a scientist. So I, for one, have worked as a scientist coming from the physics background, but also an engineer. I'm an electrical and electronics engineer uh, on that. And I've also consulted other engineers in the process to come up with specifications, because most of the specifications actually have an engineering element in it. So electromagnetics will be there, for example, in the electromagnetic compatibility, EMC, or electromagnetic interference, EMI, and other elements, which we'll discuss later. And then when we have done this, we have to work with the medical specialists. We, have, we created a consortium, a network, just using WhatsApp, you know, uh, lobby medical specialists who are using CPAP machines, ventilators, and ask them to review what we had developed as technical specifications in draft form. So they made their inputs, criticisms, and we reworked that and came up with a cleaner version. They took that one to the Ministry of Health, uh, specifically the Division of Physical Assets Management, which actually is in the charge of you know, reviewing specifications, requirements in the hospitals for all the equipment, but also procurement of the same. And if there be any other innovation or development of a new uh, device, it must comply or be approved at least through that division. So we lobbied them uh, to, to consider. Apart from that, we need to consider the cleaner, you know, ventilator machines or CPAP devices, breathing aid things, on, most often time after use, they must be disinfected. They become unclean and must be cleaned. So we cannot forget the cleaner, someone who doesn't even hold a bachelor's to clean. They need to be able to assemble and disassemble parts of the breathing aid machine and clean them appropriately without actually poisoning any of the parts, without actually, you know, uh, losing certain tight, uh, you know, parts which might actually cause some leakages, either oxygen leakage or indeed, you know, uh, radiation uh, or signal, uh, you know, uh, cuts. So this is the kind of partnership that was critical for us 
an ecosystem that was necessary for us to develop uh, specifications. And from this uh, point, I would like to say that apart from breathing aid devices, it is also important to consider what other you know, uh, medical equipment would require specifications or standards. Now, just to be sure that I'm connected, uh, can I hear someone say, yes, uh, we, 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 with you, we, we're okay. Are you listening? Yes, yes, we are okay. Yes, we are okay. Okay, perfect. So yes, I'm, yes. I'm happy to make you aware because I'm a telecommunications engineer and I always want for feedback just to make sure that the communication is in sync and that the signal cool. is being received faithfully. So this is good. This is good. Cool, cool, So, cool. yeah, so there is another dimension, you see, most of the newborn babies in the neonatal condition, okay, 10% of the newborns require PT. PT is nothing but phototherapy. You know, otherwise, without phototherapy, they would actually uh, develop uh, neonatal jaundice, and which is, is bad. And therefore, they must be put in a chamber. In that chamber, the requirement is that the baby, the newborns, must be exposed to a wavelength of light in the range of 430 to 490 nanometers. So this is a specification. You cannot design a jaundice or blue chamber for newborns without considering the wavelength. Now, if you see in the, way, in the graph that I've plotted in there, you notice actually that the, uh, the range of the wavelength from 430 to 490 creates a blue light. The, the, the color is blue. So it means that you can easily design a chamber or a box with LEDs or light source generating blue light, and uh, then you actually are pro uh, uh, meeting one specification. And the next thing is intensity. The intensity of that radiance or irradiance, okay, should be in the range of 10 microwatts per square centimeter. So that's the cross-section exposition or exposure, uh, expo exposure limit of the irradiance. So these two can help a design engineer tomorrow or the other day <clears throat> to easily come up or design uh, you know, uh, a blue chamber for treating uh, uh, or providing phototherapy to newborns, which uh, is a requirement. Now, uh, ladies and gentlemen, <clears throat> you will notice uh, that in the design competition in the boot camp that we are in, uh, 10 days. This week, today is the third day. The first day we had to look at inter, uh, identification of needs. Yesterday was about conceiving or conceptual design. And today is about identification of standards. Day three. We would like, my, my, my bid is that by next week, Friday, the 10th day, when we'll be having a project presentation, <clears throat> it will be very useful to see products, processes, innovations which have complete clear standards and specifications regarding performance or criteria uh, for the design. And that's why today our labor today has been on identification of standards and giving example specifications as we are doing. <clears throat> uh, having gone through the process that uh, I worked through in Malawi, uh, from the University of Malawi perspective with partners from all sectors, including cleaners, uh, the Ministry of Health in Malawi was able to accept our submission of technical specifications for breathing aid uh, ventilator and CPAP or beep machines. You can actually see on the screen uh, that uh, <clears throat> the Secretary for Ministry of Health uh, actually through a technical uh, person, Rumbani Sidira, who is the chief biomedical engineer. You need to have biomedical engineers <clears throat> placed in critical positions in government, in, especially in the Ministry of Health, to <clears throat> actually improve the healthcare systems by giving uh, accurate technical uh, you know, uh, advice, as uh, was the case in Malawi. So actually, our technical specifications, which we developed, which I will present with you before you today, uh, and you have a copy of that, uh, we accept it, uh, just, just like that. So they reviewed their three paragraphs and they say, I am pleased to inform you that the specifications have been accepted. So that was a very important aspect. <clears throat> so having seen that the <clears throat> specifications have been uh, accepted, in Africa, I reviewed further interest to see where are we as Africa, as a, as a continent, 53 or 54 uh, member states. Uh, regarding medical uh, devices and equipment on standards and specifications. It was very clear that our own 
African Organization for Standardization, also has no <coughs> technical team or technical committee which can consider, review, and discuss issues on medical uh, uh, devices and equipment. And COVID-19 has given us, shown us a gap in this field and it has actually uh, deliberately you know, created an opportunity for local and international regional organizations to consider medical devices and equipment, including on a matter related to standardization and specifications. And the ASO, or African Standards Organization, wrote all the member states pleading with them, and this was done on 10th June, last week on Tuesday, just last week, to say, could you please submit to us nominations of experts in your, on your member states, in your countries, who can sit on the technical committee of ASO. So it will be ASO, stroke TC, particularly on medical devices and equipment and several other cosmetics and related products. And in Malawi, uh, from the University of Malawi perspective, uh, my name was submitted. So definitely I'll be sitting on ASO, uh, to guide on the issues of medical devices and equipment. Uh, I think from hence on, we'll have online meetings and ultimately uh, uh, possibly physical meetings to drive the agenda of standards and specifications for critical uh, area of medical devices and equipment. <clears throat> now, from here onwards, from category A to K, I will present uh, the specifications for breathing aid devices and machines. And I think we'll have a discussion on that. This will now get a bit more technical, but also interesting because it's simplified. So I think that, I think uh, let's have uh, a touch on this. For breathing aid devices, if we consider, for example, uh, uh, ventilators and CPAP machines or BIPs, critical first thing is the ventilation mode. Ventilation mode. So there are two modes. Number one is invasive type, which gets into stuff like pipes getting into your nostrils, uh, into the mouth, and deep other places. That's invasive. And then non-invasive with facilities and features. So for invasive type, you'd have to control several things. The mode is controlled, then you do the pressure control, volume control, and then of course you'd have the CPAP, continuous positive air pressure. Apart from that, then you have the other mode, which is non-invasive. For the non-invasive mode, most of what is uh, common and popular is the CPAP. The blue device which I showed you earlier is a CPAP developed from the University of California, uh, UCL, uh, Ventura, and it's available for exploitation. So that one is a CPAP and it is a non-invasive type. You'd also have a bi-directional positive air pressure BiPAP, but these are less common. So if one of you or any of us or any of the groups in this bootcamp would be interested to design ventilators, CPAP machines, beeps, and all that kind of thing, you go through this checklist and they say, check, do you want uh, your ventilator or CPAP to uh, consider children or neonatal conditions, pediatric of less than 5 kg or more than 5 kg to operate for babies? Yes, then you tick yes. If no, then no. And you put some comments. But for my interest as an illustration, I'm particularly interested with the element number eight, serial number eight, where you, in your mode you can ask, is there a need for a facility for an invasive mode? For example, do we need a mouthpiece okay, for, for your design? If yes, then you have to check it. And if you don't have it, you could actually look for it, scavenge from, you know, you know, uh, disposed stuff, or indeed fabricate one a mouthpiece for your uh, uh, mod. So I'll, I'll give you an example in that picture where we see a neonatal condition, a small baby, just in excess of five pages, being treated in that position using a bubble, uh, continuous positive air pressure CPAP. So this is called a BCPAP device. So uh, in this, normally what is critical is how much pressure should be uh, uh, supplied or should be added to the baby. Normally, it's, the specification is to provide the pressure within the limit of five to eight centimeters of water. So later on, I'll give the conversion table for a uh, centimeter of water, millimeter mercury, PSI, and also uh, other uh, like KPAs, kilopascals. So pressure 
units are in different uh, forms. So actually, we need to familiarize ourselves. If we'll be dealing with this kind of things, we need to familiarize ourselves with the units, the values, and the specs. So actually, I'll highlight about this in detail uh, later on. In category B, it's the parameters. Normally, there'll be so many parameters in the design of ventilators. So many parameters, pressure, tidal volume, respiratory rate, oxygen concentration are issues of interest. But however, for this discussion, I would like to limit our interest to pressure. <clears throat> so normally, <clears throat> we would say pressure should range from zero to 100 centimeter of water. But if you consider the airway pressure, uh, manometer or the gauge, which is normally put in the ventilator design, some of the ventilator designs would be from zero to 80 centimeter of water. Let us not be worried about the units. As I said, that some of you are familiar with KPAs, kilopascals, some are familiar with PSIs, some are familiar with millimeter mercury. So we will have a conversion table for every, uh, to, all, or to all that. There's no problem. In fact, 100 centimeter would be equivalent to maybe 9.8 kilopascals KPA. So that's what we have. So in terms of uh, treatment, when you have a ventilator placed or mounted to a patient, normally we don't expect uh, the pressure to exceed the 40 centimeter of water, unless if the patient has acute respiratory, respiratory uh, distress syndrome. So in the comments, you have to say that we have discovered that the pressure has increased to 45 or to 50, that 50 centimeters of water. An alarm will buzz, and someone has to explain why is that so. So you say, okay, the condition is indeed acute. So that's why how uh, 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 specifications are important. <clears throat> On the tidal volume, I think I wanted to illustrate it very clearly. <clears throat> for any patient, <clears throat> for any human being, we have two lungs, and the, this is called the lung model, where oxygen will come in with the tidal volume but also there will be uh, CO2, carbon dioxide, going out. So those two waves will be known. The typical four volumes which are of interest is residual volume, expiratory reserve volume, tidal volume, and indeed, inspiratory reserve volume. <clears throat> to understand this, we have to look at, um, uh, we have to look at a graph. Uh, this graph gives at least an image, uh, I mean, uh, an illustration of the limit or range or peak values of tidal volume and of course the other volumes. And we have an animation uh, for the rank model, which helps us to see. If you look at that animation, uh, you will see that, that there is exhaust gas E out and then inhaled air in. So the inhaled air, now it's coming in, that could either be air uh, from the environment or it could be concentrated oxygen with a specific specification on the percentage, it could be 19% oxygen, 100% oxygen, or 98% oxygen. So that concentration is important. And of course, we shall have later on uh, sensors which can measure the actual percentage. That's an oximeter. So I'll show you later how the oximeter looks like. So in this model, the lung model, you see that the in and out activity of the lung must synchronize with the CPAP or the ventilator design. It's very critical and important. Uh, you can also have another condition, another patient. So this is the first patient. Patient B will come in. That's patient B. You see that patient B is having some movements, but their lung activity is slower than the first case. So this second condition, obviously, if you look at their BPM, the beats per minute, would be lower than the beats per minute of the first case. Normally, in our specifications, the beats per minute of a living person should not exceed 100. So it's a zero to 100 BPMs. But typically, even if I measure my own BPM, it's around 72, depending on conditions, of course. So these two uh, patients cannot be treated using the same CPAP or ventilator design, having the same standard uh, pressure uh, value, because obviously, it can cause a new condition which is detrimental to human body. And the condition is called uh, barotrauma. So if we force some pressure into a person which, who has a lung uh, model different from the ventilator operation, there will be barotrauma as a condition and that can destroy the lung tissues. Okay, so this can actually cause death. And that's why it's very important to study the conditions of a given patient, being a baby, 
an old person, an average person, being in mild condition or acute syndrome or distress syndrome. So that has to be studied. And we need to put sensors which can give feedback mechanism. I'm insisting on this feedback loop to the electronic circuit, which will drive the ventilator to give the appropriate pressure that is required in a synchronized manner. So that will be required as in the feedback process. So uh, that's the emphasis on this. Uh, normally, the flow diagram of a ventilator design would be like this. And at the flow level, or the bed level there, we have a patient. And to your right, you see air pressure sensor, input and output. So in the ventilator and CPAP designs, make sure that you spot somewhere a vent where you can put some sensors, a pressure sensor to measure the pressure levels in centimeter of water or other PSI or kilopascals or indeed millimeter make it whatsoever it may be. But also you need to have somewhere where you can measure uh, the oxygen concentration, in this case using an oximeter. So I'll show you also, uh, that's a pace oximeter, for example, and there stays 98. So 98 is the percentage of oxygen in the blood. So that is very important and vital. So when you are also supplying or adding uh, breath to a patient, it's very important to make sure that you are providing the accurate or required level of oxygen in the, you know, in the gas stream. Category C, I think, I think this one I'll rush through, is the standards accessories, what accessories you are interested in. And for me, I was interested with oxygen pressure, the greater, having a complete set. And this is normally a bull nose type shrewd valve, a nose which should be available to, uh, to uh, accompany the oxygen pressure, the greater. And all these other sets are typically of interest. In category D, you need to look at features. What features must accompany or be attached to a ventilator design or a CPAP machine? So uh, typically of my interest is that each and every ventilator or CPAP machine they must have alarm systems for every setting and every monitored value. So later on, we'll have a screen, a TF TFT uh, screen, a 10 inch, nine inch, whatever it may be, uh, to be able to graphically display the monitored values and the preset settings. You'd say, for example, preset volume, tidal volume, preset uh, oxygen concentration, preset uh, pressure, and they monitor them. And if they are in, ex in excess or out of bound of the settings, an alarm should be uh, you know, uh, raised. So that's what we're talking about. So this is a typical design of a TFT screen. They're already available. TFT is nothing but a thin, thin, you know, a transistor uh, implementation of the kind of screens that we have in our smartphones, but also uh, other uh, TV uh, systems. So we can use a TFT uh, screen uh, to, uh, to monitor uh, the settings uh, and the you know, values on the uh, our ventilator settings for, for the patient. Category E discusses the gas sources. So you cannot discuss about ventilator or breathing aid device or machine without discussing what is the source of the gas. So one typical uh, source of the gas, of course, is to be oxygen at concentrated levels from 0% to 100%. Uh, and therefore, you need to have an oxygen concentrator. I know, for example, investor PISA, uh, uh, Camelo has a PhD student who is, uh, you know, working on uh, maybe oxygen concentrators, and we might be talking about that later uh, together. Uh, so, uh, oxygen concentrators or compressors, and in the event that an oxygen concentrator or compressor has failed, it's not able to provide the necessary, you know, gas, then there must be in the design a compressor or compressed oxygen or air supply in a limit or range of 45 to 60 PSI. And what is 45, uh, you know, so 45 to 60 PSI. So you can actually put uh, 45 PSI there and find out how many KPS that transits to or how many centimeter of uh, water uh, or millimeter mercury that transits to. So there's actually a calculator online uh, for you to have a back to back conversion between millimeter uh, of mercury, uh, centimeter of water, KPA or kilopascals, and also PSI, which are the standard units of pressure, uh, PSIs. Um, in category uh, F is the power source. Most of the uh, CPAP or ventilator machines, previously they used to be manual, so you have to actuate them by your hand. You press them on and off, but normally the medical doctors, the nurses would be tired, and perhaps just leave it. So modernizing 
a manually actuated uh, CPAP, uh, you know, ambu bag, for example, uh, machine uh, to provide the necessary breathing aid uh, requires automation. So to automate that, you would have to consider how much, you know, of actuation you do or that. And if it's automated, then you have to supply uh, power. So the normal power thought process is to consider grid power supply. But in the events that you don't have grid power supply or blackout, which is common in Africa, then there must be an internal battery providing an equivalent wattage, voltage, uh, standard voltage and current product or that to supply and maintain operation at least for one hour. At least for one hour. In that way, you can actually resuscitate the condition or at least provide breathing aid support to the patient. So that is very important. So that's about the power supply. When you have designed, I, I'm just hoping that one of the groups or one of the candidates or two or so will be able to work on the CPAP designs of ventilators. If you've done that, it's also critical to specify the volume. Okay, so the volume must be specified. What is the height of your uh, uh, cubicle uh, and what is the, uh, uh, the width, the, the depth, the total volume, and also the weight. You can weigh your assembly and specify that our assembly is 5.5 kg because that's very important in the actual use because it can actually inform uh, whosoever is going to be using whether that can be wall mounted or it requires a trolley uh, for, uh, for mobility. And normally we don't recommend a ventilator or super machine or breathing aid device to be very close to the patient. So normally between the machine and the patient, there should be a five meter pipe, flexible pipe, uh, to allow, you know, play around that, but also to reduce noise uh, and other uh, things which might be uh, putting uh, the, uh, the patient at risk. The operating environment, of course, temperature and humidity are critical. Temperature ranges uh, from 5 to 40 degrees are useful, and the humidity ranges from 15 to 90 percent are of interest. So make sure that there could be a humidity sensor in or around the machine. So the humidity sensor should be able to put on the display on the nine or 10 inch TFT screen uh, to say that humidity is, for example, 50 uh, uh, percent. Uh, temperature is 24. So that's very critical information that we know. If temperature and humidity are out of bound or range, then alarms should be uh, you know, uh, worked out. So that's very important for, for us. In the next category, I think I'll pay a bit one, two, three minutes here, and you can and maybe one, one minute here. Uh, el electromagnetic compatibility and protection. Most of the technologies are being rejected uh, by many users in many countries because of the thought that there is an electromagnetic discharge or leakage uh, that is uh, detrimental to uh, body tissue. But I would like to submit to you that standards, for example, IEEE do specify SAR, we call them SARS, specific absorption rates for human body tissue from the skin to the muscle, to the fat, to the bone. So all that is very important to study that. And based on the study of SARS, specific absorption rates, it's it, 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 it was possible that for ventilators, we should be able to specify the, uh, we should be able to specify the, um, uh, the E-field intensity. So, the E-field intensity, for example, in this case, we limit it to 20 volts per meter. We all know that a volt per meter is a unit for E-field magnitude. Okay. Now, in terms of uh, magnetic field intensity or levels, we would like not to exceed 30 amps per meter. So that's the H. If we are familiar with Maxwell equations, the typical parameters in there is E as the vector, uh, E-field intensity, is H, you know, as magnetic field in, uh, parameter, and this can exist either in, uh, in, in, in a vacuum or in, in air. So normally we're considering here conditions in air, and therefore these parameters are significant, and we have to make sure that uh, the limits do not exceed that. The third parameter is the RFID, radio frequency identification immunity. In the case there are barcodes, charts, and stuff like that, or, you know, transponders, RFID transponders around and they are sending signals around in the near field communication, NFC. We need to make sure that uh, RFID are not generating uh, signals which can interfere with the operation of the ventilator or the CPAP machine. So this is very important. And a typical test assembly or a measurement setup is what I've shown you. 
Okay, so this one normally we mount it in a blue chamber, uh, which I consider to be the anechoic chamber. So this is a semi anechoic chamber. So you put up all the setup as I've shown you, and in there you can do the E, B, H uh, measurements and generate the results that we want. So this is, I think, very important. And this is a typical setup uh, by one laboratory. And the idea was, to, uh, the, the goal was to have a medical device immunity test arrangement or assembly, you know, and I think we can use or use uh, such kind of thing. Otherwise, if we are in a very, you know, impoverished places, we can use probes. I, I showed you a coax probe, which is a simple low cost test uh, kit for uh, RFID immunity. For the monitors would have uh, several aspects. Uh, are you there? Are we connected? Just to be sure, we are almost closing now. Are we there? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Yes. I, I'm not losing anyone. I, I'm glad I'm not losing anyone. So this is good. This is good. So we are almost closing. So on the category J on the monitors, uh, I have selected the three uh, aspects: tidal volume, which normally is specified in the range of zero to two thousand mill milliliters; the pressure, PEEP normally from zero to 45 centimeter of water. But as I say that we don't have to exceed the 40 centimeter of water because beyond or over above that, it becomes a critical condition. Uh, normally only reserved for critically uh, you know, uh, distress syndrome uh, patients. And of course, the other parameters as uh, specified in here. The airway pressure manometer must be in the gauge range of zero to 80 centimeter of water. So this is actually critical and we have to specify that. For the alarms, we need to have as many alarms as possible. Uh, and that's the list. And of my interest, again, I just look at the pressure. Pressure should be in the range of 10 to 80 for the alarms to be silent. But below 10 centimeters of water, you need to raise an alarm because now we're getting to low pressure. Over and above 80 centimeters of water, there is also a problem. So we need to also buzz an alarm for, for that. So this is also very uh, important. In terms of the breathing rate, beats per minute, 4 to 80 BPM is important, is good. But over and above 80 is problematic, so it's not good. And that's what we would like to say. In conclusion, uh, understanding uh, the problem is very critical in developing the solution uh, to the design aspects that we're talking about. And the standards, I repeat, I come again, that the standards are very crucial in every process, including design. And here we're in a boot camp. This is a design competition. We would like to see you smiling, telling us about the standards you're looking at, you using, and the specification or specifications of your devices or prototypes, your innovations. That, that would be very interesting. And then to do that, we always need to also consider participatory approaches. This is recommended in the design process. That's why we are in groups to make sure that uh, all the groups are looking at all these things. We are able to peer review each other. And we need to be familiar with the provisions in more, both local and regional, uh, uh, regional in, and international standards you know, in, in this case. In this discussion, which I am now concluding, the focus is on the breathing aid device specifications. And for the boot, bank, uh, boot camp, all innovators should provide specs for their developed innovations, be it you know, process, you know, product, or business model. It is very important. So I think we're looking, with, this is a big challenge to you colleagues, my dear friends, innovators, that please consider that you provide specs or specifications for your innovations in the process product or business model by Friday 26th. Uh, next week. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, the assembly that I'm showing you there in blue, that one is a product from MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology USA. And um, uh, they used to use a manual operation, uh, which I said now it has been automated to have mechanical parts, you know, to give a rhythmic okay, actuation of the ambulance bag to provide the necessary pressure at a given, you know, specifications uh, and requirements. And uh, to do that, you need some electronic uh, circuits. So you see there are some electronic circuits uh, in between the laptop, the computer, and the assembly. And over there, you see a mannequin. We don't do medical equipment or devices without considering our patient. A patient could be modeled as a phantom or indeed a mannequin. So what you're seeing there is a mannequin having an invasive 
you know, pipes into the mouth uh, to provide breathing aid. This is MIT uh, solution, which is also available for exploitation. So this is the end of my uh, presentation. Uh, colleagues, uh, thank you uh, very uh, much. And I think I'm available for, uh, uh, for interaction. Uh, I'm just getting back to my uh, Zoom uh, box. Uh, I stop uh, the, I'm stopping the uh, sharing and I'm available. Hello, everyone. Hello. Hello, hello, everyone. Hello, Chamora. Hello. Yes, sir. yes, so that's it. All right. So, sure, back to the anchor. And is on mute. I want to thank Tamora for the presentation and also you for being here uh, so late. Uh, and you started today, I'll say like five hours ago. So it yeah. was an intensive day. So thank you all for your commitment. Mm -hmm. So any question for Chamora? Comments or questions? I love questions. I love comments. Love discussions. Uh, I have a question, but Lynette seems to have a question. Am I right? No, no. I, I'm, I'm okay. <laughs> okay, now I have a question regarding the standard that you have in Malawi, if understood well, was a proposal uh, by you and your group. Uh, what's yes. the connection with the standards of ISO or the European one? Are there any connections, similarities? Okay, yes. Uh, so in there, there are some ISO standards because uh, we part of the uh, technical specifications uh, standards that we developed were adapted or adopted from the WHO technical specifications, which considered FCDA for the US. Uh, we looked at FC, uh, FDA and uh, FDA, and then for Europe EC. And of course, for some of the mechanical parts, of course, ISO, British ISO, ISO standards. Yeah. And uh, then we, we actually generalized them and they considered that at least these are the ones. So the ISO standards are very critical when we come into the actual machining. For example, if we want to come up with a, a valve needle for a CPAP or, you know, device, the valve needle would have very specific maybe diameters and all that. So then we have to pay attention to ISO standards and British uh, standards or other, yeah. For and machining and breathing, yes, yes. I was wondering uh, who is going to check about the quality of devices in, uh, in your country? So probably you already explained it, but do you have any company or institution, formal institution, who are going to check that you are respecting the standard? Okay, so for, for checking uh, of, the, of the actual product, what we did was we wrote a core proposal uh, with uh, University of Leicester uh, and uh, Research England uh, grant for COVID-19 response. Uh, and we managed this week to get 25,000 uh, pounds. Uh, and they looked at this specification. So they said, okay, you have done well. We have looked at, the, uh, at your specifications and your uh, idea to develop prototypes for Malawi. Uh, and we are going to do it together. Uh, there's one uh, component where we're going to do ventilator in, uh, and sip up together with investors of Leicester uh, using the 25,000 pounds. And then when we finish, this will be two prototypes. When we do the prototypes, we we'll use uh, uh, industry uh, from UK, Leicester City. So who can actually, you know, check whatsoever we have done based on the UK labs from uh, Leicester City. And then for clinical trials, for ethical clearance and the clinical trials, uh, the medical doctors or specialists in Malawi with the Minister of Health will facilitate uh, ethical clearance and the clinical trials on some patients in Malawi, but will also be supported by uh, medical specialists from Leicester City through the University of Leicester in this particular project. But that will be phase two or phase three. Phase one is to come up with the prototypes based on these specifications and the other matter. We also consider the national uh, NF, NSF uh, from uh, UK 
just to be sure that at least it's consistent with uh, uh, what we have, yes. Okay, do you think that this model can be replicated also with other devices? Yes, the answer is yes. Right now, uh, another device which is of interest is a cooler box, a small cooler box for uh, insulin, uh, uh, for insulin, uh, keeping insulin under specific temperatures from 4 to 25 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, because uh, recently, there is a, a clear uh, indication that many children or kids are being born with sugar uh, disease. So, uh, in the study in the pediatric ward, we have seen that um, uh, having an insulin box, which is under specific temperature conditions, could, maybe with a solar panel, a small solar panel, not in excess of 3 watt power, maybe 1.5 watts or 3 watts, or battery, uh, using thin film technology batteries, just a small layer, lightweight, is useful for students who are going, uh, pupils uh, who are going to school. So we need to develop specifications for this kind of box uh, and you know, test such kind of thing. Right now they're using mathematical two boxes to put an insulin uh, injection and normally the temperatures range because the metal box, so temperatures go beyond uh, 30 degrees and actually that renders the injection or insulin to be invalid. So we need to consider the cold chain supply and specifications for developing such devices. And there is indeed a demand for that in Africa and beyond. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Other question, guys? So I think uh, they are exhausted. Today we started with very technical, technical uh, classes. Uh, okay. So I want to thank you. Medical device running in the street. Uh, I don't know if you listen to the... Uh, <laughs> yes, the, yes, yes, ambulance. <laughs> ambulance, yes. Yes. So, um, I would like if you agree, of course, to say thank you to Chomora. And if you have one second per group and say we are developing this, uh, and apologize uh, for my mistake as before. Mm -hmm. Let me do. <laughs> 